Most of you are already likely familiar with Tom Vallone's work. He has been at the leading edge of innovations in zero point energy and propulsion technologies for decades now. For many years, he sat in the unique position as a patent reviewer for the US Patent Office and saw all of the brilliance of humankind coming across his desk. And sadly, he also saw what was tossed in a dusty corner, so to speak, never to see the light of day. And I know some of you here have been through that frustrating process. Today, he's one of the most respected physicists and engineers in the field of new energy solutions and holds the position of president of the Integrity Energy Research. He's a member of the National Space Society, the Union of Concerned Scientists, and a fellow of the World Innovation Foundation. More importantly, is Tom here? There he is. OK, Tom, please come on up. <laughs> Had a little issue yesterday. OK, please welcome Dr. Tom Vallone. Thank you. You're Regina, right? Yes. Oh, good to see you again. Yeah, things went well It's last been years time. since I've been. It has. Good to see you again. <laughs> All right. And to test the <clears throat> to test the volume. Yep. Okay, we're we're testing the sound right now and also riling up the crowd. <laughs> this is our theme song. If it's going to start, can I hit it? You can get up and dance if you want. <laughs> it's only one minute. Anyways. I don't know if that was loud enough. That's better. microphone too. And to start us off, I should announce that fire made us human, fossil fuels made us modern. Now we need a new replacement for fire. So Integrity Research Institute is aiming to shift the US from coal, oil, and gas to renewables and new energy to solve energy inefficiency and energy poverty. Energy poverty is the new buzzword for the rest of the world. I'm not going to touch my microphone. <laughs> Popular science uses this phrase too. And yes, my laser is working. All right. Well, the future energy goals of our institute are threesome. Uh, to expand new energy discoveries, to develop new uh, modes of propulsion and transportation instead of burning things, and also to get into electromedicine and bioenergy. And these are the three different websites that you can go to. They all lead to various interesting technologies that we've been advocating or developing. We were the actually first institute organization ever in the world to have a zero-point energy panel of experts. In fact, at least one of those experts are here today. Um, so it's interesting to pioneer new areas, including fusion. We had a fusion panel at this conference on future energy, uh, number five. And um, it's, it's interesting to present all of our publications. This is my wife, uh, who's the executive director of our institute. And um, the interesting uh, suppression that I've experienced as well was back in 1999 where the first Conference on Future Energy was held, supposed to be held at the State Department, the United States State Department Government Office. Well, I knew a person at the Secretary's Open Forum, and so for a year we planned the conference and then got to about a month before the conference, and all of a sudden Bob Park, Dr. Bob Park, professor at University of Maryland, who also has a wonderful website and email service called What's New, 
decided to lambaste and insult and degrade and denigrate our conference because, oh my goodness, we had one cold fusion speaker. <gasps> That's a no-no. <laughs> it was a big no-no 10 years ago. <laughs> In fact, the whole conference got called a cold fusion conference. And so he hammered us every week. Um, I was, and still am, working at the patent office, got my job back six years later. Um, but the interesting thing was they were embarrassed. The government's embarrassed, the patent office embarrassed, so I got fired. And we had to move to a, a hotel. The interesting thing is all the media got us. You know, nature, science, science of government, they were all on, on our backs. And uh, that helped get me fired even quicker. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. If you're on the wrong side of the media, forget it. <laughs> And interestingly enough, we're only about 10 years ahead of our time, that's all. So now in 2009, guess what? The rest of the world is using the same phrase we are. <laughs> Yippee! So uh, to remind you, energy, propulsion, bioenergetics is our watchword, our three program areas. And uh, these are some of our projects. And I'm going to go through them kind of quickly. Some of them may not be covered, but most of them will be. Um, and also the uh, website uh, URLs are also listed at the bottom there. We decided to follow the Google format. And my wife was nice enough to spend hours preparing this slide in case you were ever going to ask me, well, how much do they cost and how close are they to de finish being developed? Here's your answer. 100% <laughs> over here. These are all ready done and ready to go. And the cost is sort of on the level, on the y-axis. And then, of course, the more speculative stuff is over here, taking a little bit longer and less uh, actual development that's been accomplished. So I'm kind of uh, pleased to see this visual representation with ni nice little cartoonish icons that remind you how uh, interesting all of them are. And as Athena, goddess of wisdom and light, Daughter of Zeus, goddess of lightning, have anything to do with bioelectromagnetics? Why, of course. Bioenergetics program has been one of ours for over 10 years. And this is the book that contains all of the information. I've given separate lectures just on this topic. The two main important things I'd like to uh, share with you is that number one, the uh, transmembrane potential is something that you'll learn about in a couple seconds and also the idea that electrons are antioxidants. This is revolutionary. Um, I only know one other PhD in the world that's actually discovered this and broadcast it and has it in his book, Dr. Oshman. The important thing is that free radicals steal electrons in your body and they cause chain reactions. Anybody shower without a shower filter? Uh-oh. Each chlorine Cl2 dissociates at body temperature and they're free radicals. CL minus, they replicate about 10,000 times. Any organic textbook will tell you. And it's very um, damaging. So it's nice to have electrons on hand to quench those free radicals, stop the aging process, stop the damage. And in case you have any disease, dis-ease, um, free radicals are already present right at those spots. <coughs> and antioxidants, of course, stop the free radicals with electrons. Notice the oxidative damage causing aging in various articles. <clears throat> now, as far as your cell membrane is concerned, the membrane around every cell in your body, guess what? It can handle up to 10 million volts per meter or 100,000 volts per centimeter. And that's its standard storage voltage. You know, it's like if you had a storage battery, well, your body likes to store that kind of voltage. And, um, and it's pretty intense. It's, it's hard to imagine 10 million volts across one meter. Most insulations we know today can't handle that but your cell membrane does. <clears throat> so supplying high voltage at a, for a short period, even your cell phone for 15 minutes near your head is okay. 15 minutes a day is fine. It actually boosts your immune system and has been proven by studies. That's in the book as well. These are some of our products called the Premier Junior. And in case you didn't know what Premier stands for, Photonic Rejuvenation Energizing Machine and Immunizing Electrification Radiator. <laughs> I thought it was a cool acronym. I was, it took me a long time to come up with that one. And I invented the electric chair. Whoops, no, I couldn't call it that. I was forced to call it the energy chair, but I really wanted to call it the electric chair, you know. Positively intended, of course. Sitting right on top of a Tesla coil, 
what better way to energize your morning? <coughs> and we also have invented the bone knitting osteopad. Uh, years ago in the 1980s, I was privileged to um, be associated with the Robert Becker, um, Andy Bassett, and Art Pillow, the three kingpins of the um, bone healing signal, electromagnetic signal, the body electric. Anybody know the body electric? Yay, good crowd, good crowd. Uh, that is the Bible. That, I've heard lectures praising that book. It was a good thing Bob Becker got fired because that's how he wrote the book. You know, so I did the same thing. I got my PhD when I got fired. So, you know, you got to use the time uh, constructively. The important thing is, all three of those medical doctors never invented this, even though they knew their bone knitting electromagnetic signal could heal fractures in half the time. So I called them up, complained to them. Art Pilla told me a couple years ago on the phone, he says, well, I never got funded for it. Yeah, right. Best excuse in the world. You know, and 50% and of our population suffers osteoporosis as you get old. I knew one old lady, she broke her hip in bed. You know, what uh, agonizing thing can you have more agonizing than that, you know? So this thing will actually strengthen your bones because they're piezoelectric while you sleep. If, if you happen to be an older person. I don't see any older people here. They're as young as you feel. Um, another great product, which we think will be mass marketed soon, patent pending. <clears throat> is Dr. Panting's electric antioxidant clothing. And we found that microcurrent is a nice substitute for high voltage because you can get microcurrent all day long for hours at a time and it does the same therapeutic um, action by providing electrons through the skin to any areas along the meridians actually into acupuncture points. <clears throat> And we're also promoting and uh, advocating, and we actually have the TD-1000 that Dr. Paharic invented for nerve deafness. And it was fascinating to uh, study with him. I recorded his testimony. I have all his lab notes. Uh, they were all donated by his family. But this particular one I thought was very interesting, and, I, and I'd love to see it come to the application um, in the deaf schools and the deaf um, universities that I know about because a certain number of deaf people are nerve deaf and you can stimulate the nerves with what uh, this patent describes is an envelope of frequencies and it only takes a few weeks. So it's fascinating work and certainly worthwhile. So our institute does energy research and education with scientific integrity. Uh, we have conferences, books, reports. We've had maybe over almost 10 conferences now. We do the e-news every month, by the way. You can go to our website and subscribe for free to our Future Energy News. I've been doing it 10 years now, every month, and I try to include at least five or six stories that I think are the best cutting edge energy stories you want to learn about. Advocacy for the Common Good, nonprofit, charitable organization. We accept donations and give you a tax deductible letter. <coughs> and I was on CNN talking about this stuff too. And here's a little movie clip to give you a biased viewpoint. Understand. The world can't just quit on oil and nuclear power or cold turkey. You'll dismantle our entire economy overnight. You're right, Lee. And why free energy? Well, free is just another word for socialist. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? It's the Watchmen movie. It was a graphic novel turned into a movie. But it's one of several, maybe half a dozen movies that mentioned free energy. Uh, Chain Reaction was another one. There was a, a series of them. And I always find the perspective they have is always negative. <laughs> um, so uh, in, our, in this country, we decided to go with the capitalist approach. And guess what? It, that leads to two-thirds of U.S. energy uh, electricity being wasted. You know, it's a, little, uh, a slight compromise for making money. That's an important part of the capitalist approach. But this graph is very amazing. It was prepared by the U.S. Energy Association, which I actually was a member of for a while in the Washington, D.C. area. And, um, and it tells you every place the energy goes from generation to delivery. And, um, and we only get uh, three trillion kilowatt hours uh, actually delivered to the homes and businesses. And here's another, and I'm going to try this and I think it'll work. This is a two-minute Shell Oil viewpoint on future energy. I'm telling you, future energy is coming everywhere. It's really interesting. Okay, now I'm going to try this, and it, it worked several times when I did it. I have my own little 
internet jetpack, and it should flip over in two seconds. Now, the good part about this, one million new people per week is bad news, of course. That's what our population growth right now is. And what she's going to tell you in a second is what Shell's doing all about it. Now, I think it should flip over to the internet shortly. My computer is responding, I'm sure. I don't hear any sound. Click on that link. Click on, I did, yeah, I clicked on it. Well, I'm going to click on it again. Yep. Okay, the hourglass is a good uh, indication we're headed toward the right direction. Maybe it's underneath and it's like a pop. Yeah, Fast forward to 2050. The world's population has grown to 9 billion. Okay, I'm going to stop her for a second and slide this over. <laughs> oh, nobody's looking. It's a, yeah. this, is, this is called sleight of computer instead of sleight of hand. All right. Okay, now Shell Oil's got the solution. They're, they're, they're real good about solutions. That's Here two go. billion more people added to the planet over the last 40 years. In addition, millions of people are enjoying a better standard of living, so energy demand has shot up, doubling our current rate. At the same time, scientists believe that CO2 emissions will need to be halved to avoid serious climate change. What's shaping that future? Millions of people across the developing world are improving their quality of life. They're buying their first fridge, computer or car. If we all continue to use energy the way we do today, energy demand by 2050 could rise by even more, perhaps as much as three times the current rate. Shell scenario planners think a big gap between energy supply and demand could emerge. That gap will have to be closed, either by demand being forced down, or supply being ramped up, or some mix of both. But just how that will happen is uncertain. So, the world will face a zone of uncertainty. We will have to draw on many different sources of energy to meet our needs. By 2050, a third of the global energy mix could come from renewables. Fossil fuels and nuclear power are likely to make up the rest. The future will also call for greater energy efficiency and more lower CO2 options. How is Shell responding? Yeah, how is Shell responding? The challenge is a big one, which the world will have to tackle together. At Shell, we're working with partners to deliver more energy, right. investing heavily over the next few years to develop new sources of oil and gas. Oh, yeah, we're producing it. more natural gas, <laughs> which represents cleaner energy, as it emits no, up to 70% yeah. less carbon dioxide than coal in power plants. We are developing That's smarter good. energy through products and services that help our customers get the most out of the energy they use, oh. boosting efficiency and cutting their CO2 emissions. Yeah, how are they going to do Innovation that? Innovation oh, from Shell. Helping meet the world's growing energy needs in a responsible way. Very responsible. <laughs> and that's the best you're going to get from all the oil companies, I'll tell you. It's amazing. I've been to some of their meetings too. It's really scandalous. So, yeah. Yeah, in fact, I had a, um, what was it, Shell, um, British, British Dutch Shell. Uh, CEO in Houston. I was invited, private meeting, uh, panel discussion. Right next to her, next to him was Vinod Khalsa. Vinod Khalsa is an amazing uh, entrepreneur and uh, he can bring a product to market and replace the previous product within five years. That was his bragging <coughs> point. He's sitting right next to the CEO. So of course I asked my embarrassing question at the end. Um, what, what, is your company prepared for the time when your product will be obsolete? <laughs> You know, <laughs> electric cars are coming, buddy. You know, and he says, "Oh no, our studies say that until 2050, we're going to still be burning uh, gasoline." So you know, I'm sitting there like this. You, know. you can't talk to those guys. And you see from this uh, approach, there's a little bit of bias 
you know, we know we got to reduce carbon dioxide by half, but I don't think anybody's going to believe you that natural gas, oil, and, and hopefully no coal will, uh, will do it. Now, here's Rocky Mountains Institute uh, solution. This is a very nice presentation, by the way. It's actually on our website when the launch occurred. It was at National Geographic. And their big solution is, and this is my question mark, I added this little annotation with a question mark, energy savings is going to get us to that three times extra energy? I'm not sure. Uh, everybody's got to cut two-thirds out of their energy use, okay? Good. Now we're, now we're headed toward the future. And unfortunately, you know, even talking to Al Gore about it, hey, he's got uh, the same opinion. We got problems. So let's take a look at the half million year, 400,000 year climate history of the Earth. I have to give great credit to Jim Hansen, who I know and I've met, talked to. Um, and, and this is the uh, series of um, correlations and tracking that the um, sea level temperature and CO2 have gone for the past half million years. Notice this peak, the highest point of all three as they track. Gee, what's this way up here? Um, let's get a close-up of that. Oh, by the way, my goodness, this couldn't be the 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide that we now are producing on the planet today. We've passed the 400 parts per million uh, threshold. Well, unfortunately, 290 is the highest the Earth has ever seen, and temperature and sea level track very nicely. So I wonder what's going to happen here at 400. Well, you can actually do the math because all of these are graded. I added the key annotated this, published this in 2006 when it came out in Technology Review. And the interesting, uh, disturbing news is that when you start counting the little grades here, you get 7 degrees F and 4 degrees C that we're already indebted for. Folks, if we stay at 400 parts per million, we're going to see the 7 degree increase worldwide. There's no way about it unless we bring down the carbon dioxide level. I don't even want to talk about sea level. Forget it. It's too scary. Well, it only took three years until the rest of the world climate committee started predicting the same thing. <laughs> That's what's so much fun about being ahead of your time. Well, is this a Promethean problem where we're stealing fire that really belongs to the gods and now we're going to need a Herculean effort to solve the problem? Yeah, I think so. Are things getting worse or does it just seem that way? Well, there is, in the last decade, we don't have the figures for this one yet, in the last decade, insurance payments for natural disasters were three times what they had been in any previous decade. And I think it's just a function of climate change. There's going to be more extreme weather events. Now, on the earthquakes, we had one in Chile and one here. And then, uh, you know, there was one in Pakistan shortly after the, the tsunami over there. That's largely a function of the way the tectonic plates move in the crust of the Earth. And the Caribbean is a big earthquake zone. And you, they just, it erupts every, every couple of hundred years, you have a, a few. So I don't attribute that so much to climate change. But these other things, you're going to have more storms as a result of the dramatic shifts in the climate, the melting of the ice caps in Greenland, the, the summer clearance in the North Pole, the big chunks coming off the South Pole. All this climate change stuff is real, and, and uh, I know a lot of people want to deny it, and they think we can't afford to deal with it now that the economy's bad. But the truth is, I believe changing the way we produce and consume energy is the number one thing we could do to explode the American economy. Again, I think we could uh, bring back manufacturing to America, have enormous economic growth. When I leave you, I'm going over to an electric car exhibit that's part of our global initiative. We have four electric car manufacturers in America making cars, bringing manufacturing jobs back to this country, and I think it's conceivable that within five years we'll have as many car companies as we did before the mass consolidation early in the 20th century that left us with the big three. So it's just a question whether you see this as an opportunity or a burden, but to me, uh, I, I spent all my time trying to prove to people it's good economics to do this kind of stuff. It, I, I'll tell you why uh, this is fascinating to me. I'm going to move on. So there is the official opinion, and I think it's worthwhile noting that. And of course, he advocates electric cars, which is great. Now, electric cars are evolving. 
Um, our belief is that electric cars will have a, a charger on board soon. The transition to that is ultra capacitors, and our car company is already substituting ultra capacitors for batteries. Now, what about that climate problem? Well, in uh, 2006, we actually had the, um, I feel, the world's expert on uh, seeding of oceans, iron seeding to cause plankton blooms. Turns out that's the only solution so far proposed that actually will sequester and uh, contain <coughs> millions of tons of CO2. We actually need to get up to a couple billion tons of CO2 um, per year is what we generate. So the uh, capture is what is required. Now this is um, Russ George's uh, um, uh, satellite imagery after he had done a few of these um, ocean plankton bloom uh, iron fertilizations, and even Greenpeace was out there to stop them. You know, it doesn't make any sense. They're trying to stop things that are actually are natural. Well, years later, once again, we see in 2012, Nature Magazine finally caught up and proved that the captured, um, CO2 captured plankton uh, actually settled, most of them settled to the uh, ocean floor. And this is great news, because it really is a sequestering uh, uh, mechanism. And the, we have the DVD of his original presentation. All of this is online, July 2012, uh, July 18th, uh, was New Scientist version. Now, the interesting thing is, a lot of us like free energy. I certainly do. I've been advocating it for decades, um, since 1980, actually. <laughs> and um, energy harvesting is the new buzzword, because you have to have something that's acceptable in terms of phraseology. So uh, when you want to say the word free energy, just move over and say energy harvesting. And this is how they're doing it now. I see in all the great um, uh, journals the concept of developing small antenna, even called rectennas, to capture megahertz, gigahertz, and even up to terahertz. And we have to give credit to Dr. Uh, Modell from the University of Colorado here in Boulder, who's doing work in the terahertz range. And a breakthrough? You like breakthrough energy, right? Well, here's one, and this is 500 kilowatts per kilometer, only it's over in Israel. It should be over in this Western Hemisphere, too, and throughout Europe. Um, Inuatech has been at it for years, and they've proven both on highways and also on railways that the piezoelectric panels, which you see here, can actually be under the pavement or under the tracks and generate this amazing half of a gigawatt per kilometer. In other words, you could have distributed power very nicely throughout any infrastructure and get rid of the grid. The grid is the worst um, uh, umbilical cord that J.P. Morgan ever invented. You know, got to give J.P. Morgan the credit. He's the one to stop wireless power. Here's another great one we advocated in 1999. Paul Brown was the first one to get a patent on this. And we actually had him speak and present this concept of a nuclear battery in a small package using tritium. Well, Bell, Bell Labs patented it. They tried to infringe on his patent. And now, finally, City Labs has produced this small device. And to tell you the truth, folks, this is exactly how you introduce free energy into society. Like the movie was showing us, the Watchmen movie, you can't disrupt all the markets worldwide. You know, you're going to get a backlash. Well, you start small, get that little small part, uh, part out there, and nobody will notice. And certainly hardly anybody noticed this introduction. But this is a 25 to 40 year battery. That's pretty hot. Here's another little quickie that I think is a breakthrough as well. These actuators can exchange moisture with the environment, expanding when they absorb water and contracting when they expel it. In this video, you can see two different sizes of actuators swelling and toppling across a flat, wet surface. And in this video, you can see one of the actuators responding to moisture. The mechanical energy it produces is converted to electrical energy and stored in a small capacitor off-screen. There's the wire. Eventually, the stored electrical energy may be used to power very small electronic devices. I showed this video at the United Nations and nobody understood it. They couldn't figure out why is this thing moving around and what does it have to do with energy. Um, anybody understand what they just told you, MIT? No. no. Okay, yeah, I figured because to tell you the truth, folks, this is a true breakthrough. This is a true free energy generator. Nobody in the world ever thought that a wet surface could be a source of energy, electrical energy. <laughs> I mean, this is fabulous. And I was so happy to, to put it in the E! News, let the world know. We got thousands of people on the E! News list. But the fascinating part is, you know, as I said, you start out small. This, this powers small devices because they only have a small piezo. 
but the polymer is what's doing the work. In other words, they're showing the polymer bending back and forth. Well, what it's doing is it gets wet, it bends. Gets dry, it stretches out. Gets wet, bends, and so forth. So it's doing the oscillating automatically based on the, wet, the wetness. And who would think that, and they call it now moisture gradient. Isn't that fun? It's like all of a sudden it's scientific. <laughs> Duh. Where does the energy come from? That's what I want to know. <laughs> well, it's the evaporation of the water and, you know, the polymers. Anyways, without going into the physics of it, these smart guys put a little piezo panel and they got energy, electricity out of it. So watch out for lots of new sources of energy. Another one is my great favorite is magnetic field gradients. I've given a separate lecture on this. I won't spend too much time on it. But these are all the toys I've built looking at the spiral magnetic motor. The spiral motor I've given a paper on separately analyzing all the different sizes, graphs and charts showing you can get 90% of the cycle power just by permanent magnets. And this is very promising. In fact, there's a University of Tokyo professor who wants to work with me for the final little um, transition. And I was going to show another video, but you know, time constraints. So the important thing is we're now moving to the double track called V-Track. And this is, I think, the most promising. You can see, you know, on YouTube, you can't believe everything in YouTube. You always see these perpetual motion machines working. And of course, I built exactly what you see here. And it doesn't quite work as it's designed because it's mechanical. So the important thing is there's lots of transducers and actuators that we can add to make the transition effective without external energy. And why is this going to work? Well, because zero-point energy is involved in producing every spinning electron, and the spinning electrons line up to produce magnetic fields. So, duh, I mean, why not start using them? <laughs> and of course, zero-point energy has been around for quite a while. Well, luckily, Dr. Modell has patented another approach to harnessing zero-point energy, and he did so through the concept of a Casimir cavity. And the Casimir cavity, of course, is micron size, and it produces uh, a limitation of, of frequencies. And, of course, all the frequencies are on the outside producing a little bit of force. Well, we sponsored in uh, 2012 the presentation that he did on uh, extracting zero-point energy as he forces noble gases through the cavities. I almost thought it's similar to the PAP engine, and I was pleased to um, study this invention as well. Let's talk to uh, Garrett Dell. So pumping gas through Casimir cavities has uh, now been uh, proposed as a quantum vacuum extraction uh, uh, modality. And the conclusion they make in the patent is we are effectively extracting energy locally and replenishing it globally. Imagine extracting thimblefuls of water from the ocean, the ocean being depleted but no practical consequences. And that's the way to view the quantum vacuum really as a plenum uh, that you can tap into. And it really is still a physicist's dilemma. Well, the other idea of tapping the quantum vacuum, but also the thermal sea, I mean, thermal energy is all around us, ambient energy, is with these tiny little uh, rectennas and diode arrays. So I worked on that as well. Our lab has actually tested some and produced nanoamps of uh, current. And my proposal is to get into the diode energy array uh, which is also a very promising concept, following along with the rectenna idea. Well, this is for Dr. Garrett's uh, benefit. Uh, we talked about some other modes of zero-point energy um, extraction, and the, the law of thermodynamics always comes up, you know. So this is my favorite citation. It's from Science, Volume 299, uh, 2003. And what's interesting and very baffling is that work can be extracted from a single heat bath. In other words, the output and the input are the same temperature. <laughs> Hello, this is impossible, right? No. Um, and it's called quantum coherence, and the energy efficiency exceeds a classical engine even when the temperatures are the same using this micro laser. You can produce amazing effects. There's Casimir uh, engines that are designed around this concept, too. Another one that's fascinating to me is the idea of a quantum ratchet, and this is uh, negative work, by the way, is free energy, just another buzzword. Um, and the quantum ratchet actually rectifies thermal noise, which to me is the same thing as non-thermal noise, depending on where you are. If you're out in space, you're going to do it from non-thermal, but the ambient effect are the same. And this is also published in Physical Review E, and it's 1999. Experimental tunneling, tunneling ratchets. 
Now, one of my favorite is the, um, if I pronounce it correctly, Van den Breck, um, professor from the uh, Denmark, Belgium University, who's actually proposed rectifying thermal energy with a Brownian refrigerator. And we get this uh, interesting uh, utilizing uh, thermal fluctuations. And he has a great comment in the abstract here. He says, uh, paradoxically, thermal fluctuations themselves can be harnessed to re reduce uh, thermal jitter um, and generate power through rectification. So instead of fighting the uh, thermal fluctuations, he wants to use them. And one of the last things I thought I'd uh, throw out there is the idea of a repulsive casimir force. This has actually been proven to be possible. And for physicists who study the casimir force, we always think of it as an attractive force. In fact, if you work in the nanotechnology region, uh, which I know some uh, physicists who have worked there, if you get something closer than one micron in distance, it all of a sudden attracts, because there's a third order attraction force. It's very powerful. And it's called stiction. Once it attracts and touches, forget it. You can't use the part anymore. You have to throw it away and start over. So the point is that once we find, and as this article points out, this is Physical Review Letters 2002, volume 89, um, once we find that there's a transition point, depending on ge geometry and temperature, to getting a repulsive force, hey, as an engineer, I'd say, we can design an oscillating engine that'll probably depend only on ambient temperature. I think that's pretty cool, another way to convert it. And negative quantum vacuum energy, which is another word for zero-point energy, has been also proposed by moving mirrors very quickly. And this was done in 2001, Dr. Paul Davies. Well, guess what? Years later, they actually now have done it. And this was um, um, published in, in a reputable journal as well. Um, you probably see the citation up here uh, as well. Nature magazine uh, in 2011, June, June 3rd. So we see the virtual particles are actually becoming, we observe the virtual particles that compose the quantum vacuum. Isn't that cool? <laughs> it's about time we started using them, observing them, and put them to work, you know, instead of letting them sit there. So, and how about traveling through space using quantum vacuum energy? Well, I know Dr. Um, Fronig, who's uh, uh, presented at our conferences more than once, good friend, he uh, actually teaches at the University of Adelaide in Australia, and the fascinating part is he has a theoretical physicist working with him to develop this superluminal saucer concept based on a toroid. In other words, he's per perturbing the permeability and permittivity of space. And he has the theoretical backing. He's built the toroids, tested them. He's at the experimental stage where he said, OK, where's the next step? Come on, let's see it work, you know? And um, so I always try to push these guys a little bit further than, than just experiment and publish. Um, well, the, the point that I'm making here, and, is, and to me is very powerful, is guess where the zero-point field loses its drag? Outer space temperatures. Anybody know in the audience? Okay, kids, what's the temperature outer space? Zero. Nope. Three degrees K. It's still pretty close to zero. <laughs> and that's pretty amazing. You get a benefit for going into space. This, this machine will work better. So, and further information is in my book, which is, and they, I also have amazing, I think amazing, compilation of all these tricks in the uh, Vacuum Engineers Toolkit. And that's for sale at the bookstore. And the toolkit's online. Actually, that one page is online if you want all the good stuff in one page. Now, atmospheric energy is also a good source of electricity. Here in Colorado is actually a, where Tesla had a lot of fun proving that atmospheric energy is available. And it's an all-American invention. Ben Franklin was the inventor and one operated for 86 years. Very simple design. You can put up a 24-foot uh, antenna. And the paper that Jeff Menko um, um, contributed to our conference in 99 pointed out the atmospheric potential is gigawatts. And it's renewable. The, the charges you pull down through your antenna to drive the motor go back into the ground and back up to the clouds. And here's the basic diagram. It's a really neat electret motor that he added to get fractional horsepower out of it. And he's published in Scientific American and other places as well. The only um, trick is a tiny amount of polonium to ionize the air right at the tip where you're getting the uh, electrons come in. Very simple design, should be really uh, amplified and, and multiplied, just like windmills. Um, and now, one of my favorite uh, pet projects is the advocacy for wireless power. 
Does anyone understand what the Wardenclyffe Tower actually was intended for? Maybe a few in the audience? Well, yes, and, and the rest of the world doesn't even know. Uh, why'd they have a mushroom cap? Who knows, you know, they, we knocked it down, it was a dangerous tower. Um, but our institute was the only one in the world to celebrate the centennial in 2003. And we did so with a conference, Tesla conference, with all the best speakers on wireless power and the history of Tesla, and also produced an uh, edited book of all those papers. And the fascinating part here I need to emphasize, you can memorize, is that 95% efficiency is there. Instead of losing two thirds as you transmit energy to your customers, you get 90, you only lose 5%. I mean, that's a big difference, huge difference. So I know people that are now advocating rebuilding the Warncliffe Tower. And these are some of the original uh, drawings showing how resonantly it um, travels throughout the Earth ionosphere cavity. And we were fortunate this year in July 2013 to have um, Dr. Simos from Brookhaven National Labs give his talk on the validity of wireless transmission of power with equa equations showing how uh, the transmission is accomplished through the Earth ionosphere cavity. Very fascinating presentation. I felt really uh, excited by the fact that it, with his caliber, um, having a PhD PE as well, of course, that's very important. Um, and also the efficiency and the uh, viability of the transmission. He had um, animations to show how it worked as well. So moving right along to transportation, guess what? It's possible to run a car on metal. I pause for incredulity to happen in the audience. Well, yes, folks, it has been done in rockets, but it never was very good because the metal would kind of gum up the works. Well, now it turns out that Oak Ridge National Labs found out how to do nano-sized particles, which don't gum up the works. And as they oxidize, as they burn, they oxidize, and then you collect the oxidized metal, you can actually recycle it if you want to. And, um, and it has half the fuel tank size, which is a good advantage, and there's various metals you can use, which obviously are um, pretty cheap. Well, I promised a few folks that I would give the review that I did this year at the conference on Future Energy on Joseph Papp. The Papp engine to me is a very perplexing engine. It has um, uh, very interesting patents that can be studied. Here's Joseph Papp uh, in front of his 100 horsepower engine fueled by noble gases. Noble gases, helium, krypton, xenon, and so forth. And, it's, and to most people, it's impossible. Noble gases don't react with anything. They, you know, and, and the, the credibility, uh, believability of this is, is difficult to overcome in most uh, people you talk to. Comparing with a two-stroke engine, the PAP engine's a lot simpler because it has no exhaust. And we actually have Russ Grease here. I don't know if he's in the audience, but uh, he has a hat on. You can't miss him because he has a hat on. But he has a great display of the PAP engine devices that he's built, and there's, um, there it is. This is actually on display at this conference, right around the corner, and you can actually examine it up close, and it has a piston inside that goes up every time it explodes. I mean, just imagine, and there's two videos online that show the 40,000 volt spark firing into a little chamber of noble gases that also need to be ionized through a, a thoriated <coughs> electrode, <clears throat> but it's a positive feedback circuit. And the two cylinders act as capacitors to oscillate between the two uh, cylinders of charge dissipation. Here's a thoriated sealed electrode that does the ionization of the gases. And so the noble gases are getting ionized, and they also are described as a plasma expansion. And specially designed pistons is, are necessary as well. Here's the secret, the mixture that Russ Grease has uh, published online, helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon in the right uh, ratio. And this is fascinating to me to watch these videos and see the person pushing the button, see the piston go up, no exhaust, goes back down, push the button, goes up, goes back down. I'm thinking, where's the next step of eight cylinder motors? Come on, you know? <laughs> we, we don't need just one, this thing actually works. So um, we're, we're hoping to see the, the advancement of this. And this is one, I created the tiny URL for this, so make it easy for everyone to go see the video. RWG Research. If you just remember RWG Research, the, pre, uh, the preface, the first part is all the same. Preview tinyurl.com. 
And you can see this thing firing. Also, I have to give credit to Bob Rohner. Bob Rohner is the last living person who worked with Joseph Papp. He actually has a, an example or an actual Papp engine as well. And he's designed his own. I stopped the video right when this thing was firing. And once again, the same idea is he keeps firing it again and again and again. And then the tiny URL for this is Rohner Roberts. <clears throat> so, how about ocean Poseidon energy? Well, the world's largest tidal wave generators are now going online, 200 megawatts. This is very exciting, because the more renewable energy we have, the less likely it is the carbon dioxide will build up. And I have great hope for coal fusion. Obviously, I've advocated it. We've even had one coal fusion, LENR, um, we called it LENRU, L-E-N-R-E-W, an educational workshop. Um, but the point is that uh, it's a slow development because there's so many unknowns to the coal fusion community. And the process itself hasn't been uh, designed through the help of nanotechnology uh, community, which could have been uh, really simulating it very nicely. Kino Reeves, chain reaction, this should be on your uh, DVD list because the interesting confrontation between the inventor with free energy and Morgan Freeman, the banker, he says, hey, free energy, noble concept, but what about the economic impact? <laughs> and then you hear his you know, negative reactions. Well, Apollo, the sun god, has something to say about this, too. And, of course, we have uh, an interest in joining the Power Africa project because, hey, there's energy poverty throughout the world. Look at the night side picture. Most of Africa has no night lights. And South America, the same thing. So our proposal for doing this is very simple. The Time Magazine article which described Power Africa, 20 million homes or more without any lighting inside their homes in Africa, basically showed uh, kids trying to read their school books with a flashlight. So I said, this has got to stop. So our concept is a small um, LED panel, solar energy panel, and three NICAD batteries. Put them in a little module, they leave it outside all day, or even a wire that goes to the roof and basically they'll have indoor lighting at night. And it should last six or eight hours of, of lighting. And our concept, since I was at this um, youth energy, uh, youth uh, nexus, youth forum, uh, youth summit at the United Nations this year, you see amazing one-man operations that do incredible things throughout the world. So I think our institute also can get donated uh, funds and donated products to make this possible. And of course, Nikola Tesla told us, hey, there's energy throughout space. And time um, is only the uh, variable in when this um, energy will be used to power our machinery through any place in the universe. And what about the propulsion? Well, I've talked about it on various TV shows. And the nice thing is that inertial propulsion is another very fascinating um, area of study which has been denigrated, suppressed, and ridiculed. A hundred patents in our inertial uh, propulsion patent collection has been sold for about 10 years. And the fascinating thing was every PhD has dismissed this as unworkable. However, <laughs> uh, this past year, actually in 2012, Mike Gamble finally came forward with a few photographs from Boeing, where he works, and he said he finally got permission to tell the world, hey, guess what? We've been using inertial propulsion for years on our satellites. You know why? Because they don't need to, uh, as you see in just even the latest movie, Gravity Movie, oh, little jets and gas uh, propellers, and you run out of gas and you can't propel and you're lost in space. And that was happening too much to the satellites. So what I found disturbing, though, is the inventors like Kidd who actually produced the scissoring gyros, which is the phrase he used, and I knew exactly what he was talking about, to rectify centrifugal force, have already been patented but no inventors um, benefited from this uh, invention. Okay, moving on to inertia. Gee, is it possible that fast acceleration has ever been recorded on film through a circular craft? Who knows why it's circular? Well, I can talk about that in another presentation. But keep a close eye on, whoops, there it goes. How is that possible? Oh my goodness. Well, it turns out that we've also recorded Photographs, I know the uh, <coughs> photographer here, right angle turn of a triangular craft, 2 a.m. outside Seward Air Force Base in New York State, 
and the craft was moving from the top, open shutter, um, 35 millimeter on tripod, and all of a sudden it makes a right angle turn. And it keeps going and it's little red and green lights blink as if it's a conventional craft. Well, the centrifugal uh, forces there, I mean the uh, inertial forces would have probably uh, flattened all the uh, occupants as well. But this is what we're talking about that proves inertial shielding is real. It's actually possible. And the benefits, of course, are F equals MA. Reduce M, A can be very high for the same amount of force. And of course, this has nothing to do with gravity. This is inertial mass, which has always been a conundrum. Inertial mass is only related to distant stars through the Mach principle. Well, luckily, um, Bernard Hayes and his cohorts, put off and Rueda, proved that it's a zero-point energy effect. And the conclusion is, it's really a Lorentz force. As you move through the um, matrix of electromagnetic charges, which is really what the quantum vacuum is, you're interacting if you accelerate, either forward or you make your turn. And then your body moves the opposite direction. Well, if you shield the body, shield the craft, this will not happen. And we have specific ideas and also very confirmed concepts as well. Well, the last area that I'd like to just briefly cover is the um, hope that Townsend Brown will be honored in a documentary. Because his life was taking these very anomalous ideas building the craft, testing them, and showing they can actually uh, achieve propulsion. And the combination of inertial shielding and this electrokinetic or electrogravitic propulsion is very uh, powerful. And of course, it doesn't burn fuel. That's the benefit as well. Well, the conclusion of my second volume, which is available at the bookstore, is that the uh, work of Mark McCandlish, who testified at the Disclosure Project in 2001, actually drew this from the eyewitness testimony showing pulsed capacitors that are working in a, with a distributor cap in a, in a three-pronged um, rotating fashion using pulsed electrokinetics. And I've had lots of experience with pulsed electrokinetics. It's very fascinating, and it does produce force. Well, I wasn't sure if it would really work until I saw Jeff Menkel's electrokinetic equation, which is in his book, Causality, Electromagnetic Induction, Gravitation. And this shows that if you have a pulsed current, the shorter the time that you pulse the current, the more force you're going to get. And of course, there are various anecdotes, and this is how I originally got started in 1980, studying the very anomalous uh, craft that were reported from the Sunburst community, going out there, finding out Bruce De Palma was bidding, building a homopolar generator. I decided to do it for my master's project in physics. I even got a professor to approve it. So it's kind of fun to follow your dream and then write a book about it. And of course, this book is available along with many others. And we invite you to um, join our conversation at futureenergy.org. And of course, Future Energy can do our work without working our undoing. Thank you very much. Thank you.